If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of the Mind Pump. Woo! All right, so for the first uh, 45 minutes or so, we have a lot of fun. Uh, we do our introductory conversation, um, and that's before we get into the fitness stuff. Here's what we talked about in this episode. So Ooh. we start out by talking about Adam's big earthquake prediction. Uh, he's like, yeah. he's like Nostradamus. Apparently, there's going to be a big earthquake at, some, at point. some point in the future. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure he's going to be right. No, he will be right. <laughs> then we talked about the game-changing sponsor that we're now working with, the Chili Pad. So we just started working with Chili Pad. This is a water-cooled pad that goes on your bed. No EMF, so there's no electronic uh, frequency that comes off or whatever. Uh, cools down your bed. has been shown to get people to sleep 95% faster and almost double their deep sleep. Adam now no longer has to wake up to go pee in the middle of the night, so he's no longer annoying the shit out of Katrina. Hoo-ha! Thank you, Chili Pad. By the way, we have, of all the podcasts, the biggest discount on the Chili Pad. So here's what you do. Just go to ChiliTechnology.com. That's spelled C-H-I-L-I technology.com forward slash mind pump and use the code M-P-Uler. So that's M-P-O-O-L-E-R for 15% off the Uler. That's the one that's controlled with the phone app. Uh, it's the most advanced version. Then I talked about the common knowledge that proved to be false that half of all marriages end in divorce. It's not half. The actual statistic is much better than that. Something like 70% actually stay together and succeed. Why the hell have we been yeah, lied to for so long? That's all I've heard. Then just uh, Adam brings up something called mukbang. Uh, so it sounds just as it's as bad as it sounds. Mukbang. Bing, bang, mukbang. Yeah, listen to the episode. Find out what we're talking about. Um, then he also brought up how Spotify is doing emotional surveillance. This is where they're kind of uh, figuring out how people's emotions are affecting what they're listening to. And that may actually affect how you're getting advertised to. Mm, Holy crap. Creepy. Uh, Brain FM, by the way, that's uh, Justin brought that up. That actually yeah. affects your moods. That works. And it helps you sleep. Um, we got a discount with them. Go to brain.fm forward slash mind pump and get 20% off if you want better focus and better sleep. Then I talked about how Beverly Hills is no longer selling any tobacco at all because, you know, Beverly Hills, healthiest place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> Said no one ever. Exactly. Then I talked about Everly Well. Uh, and how my cousin is using their at-home testosterone test and found that improving a sleep increases testosterone by about 15%. Everly well makes at-home tests, uh, hormone tests, cholesterol tests, STD tests, all kinds of tests. You don't need a doctor's prescription. You can go to everlywell.com, use the code MINDPUMP, get 15% off any test, buy the test, do it at home yourself. They are awesome. Then I talked about how Monterey Bay, they just did some tests there and found that, very sad, uh, there's as much plastic particles in Monterey Bay as there is in the big Pacific garbage patch. Ugh, it's just kind of sad. That sucks. Then we get into the fitness portion of this episode. First question, uh, we talk a lot about whole body workouts and how they're better than splits for most people, but you know, influencers and bodybuilders, they always do body part splits. What gives? Who's right? The genetically gifted, steroid-taking bodybuilders or the guys who've been training everyday people for 20 years? I don't know. Find out in this episode. Mm. Next question, uh, what's the best way to stop or help with binging problems? So if you're somebody that uh, finds yourself gorging on a bag of potato chips and then later on feeling guilty and sad about it, listen to this part of this episode. We discuss strategies that have helped our clients in the past. Next question, how does alcohol affect your gym routine, so we get go in on alcohol, how it affects you negatively, and believe it or not, the positives of alcohol. And the final question: This person wants to know if we've ever considered doing a powerlifting competition. Also, this month, Maps Strong, one of our most effective muscle building and metabolism boosting workouts, is fifty percent off. Now, this workout is unconventional, so you're gonna be doing exercises you may not be used to. Exercises like zercher squats or the circus press or farmer carries. This workout gets your body strong. It builds muscle. It burns a shit ton of calories and it speeds up your metabolism. And it's fun. This is a very, very fun program. Here's what you got to do to sign up. Go to mapsstrong.com, M-A-P-S-S-T-R-O-N-G.com and use the code STRONG50, 
S-T-R-O-N-G-5-0 for the 50% off discount. Go do it right now. Hey, so tell me about that crazy prediction, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just uh, I was just watching uh, Lindsay from Almost 30 there, uh, which, by the way, I think their episode goes up, coming up here real soon here. Domenica. Uh, uh, yes. <clears throat> Sunday. Aug- uh, Almost 30 girls. Uh, Lindsay was posting a story on some podcast that she listens to that I guess the whole thing is all about, the whole podcast is about the big earthquake that's coming and she you know, ordered her three-day survival kit. And I was asking you, because she's talking about it's not a matter of if it's going to happen or not. It for sure, if you don't believe in science, and like so she's just, it's for sure coming, the, this massive earthquake that's supposed to be crazy. Uh, and I asked you what, what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, mm. yeah, for sure. Sounds like escape from L.A. Yeah, for yeah. sure there's going to be a big earthquake at some point. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's one of the biggest, uh, we're on one of the biggest uh, faults mm. in the world. So yeah, at some point there's going to be a massive we're earthquake. We're destined for one up here. Yeah. it's In, in fact, I think uh, if there's a big enough earthquake, Southern California, part of Southern California can sink into the ocean. Yeah. Or was that like a plot from yeah. Superman 3? Yeah. Was that no, Superman 3? I'm telling 3? you, it was Kurt Russell, dude, Escape from LA. <laughs> no, wasn't it the one where- surfed out of it. Wasn't yeah. it the one in Superman where uh, Lex Luger shoots the- nuke into the fault and it causes such a big earthquake yeah. and then superman gets down there but just in time to like stop southern california from floating off mm. but fails to save lois lane remember she gets buried in the car so then superman this is where jump the shark uh, this is where that term comes from or part this is a good example of it superman who can do almost anything then does something that's just ridiculous he spins the earth backwards, which I guess apparently <laughs> so it goes back in time. Apparently, makes the earth go back in time. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. logic. Yes, remember that? Yeah. I don't remember. He that. flies around I the do earth. just super fast. He flies around the earth backwards and yeah. causes it to spin backwards. Which in real life, if that really happened, yeah, imagine that would destroy the world. Like, yeah, all the oceans. Yeah, the would- oceans is like smash into like every like <laughs> landmass. Like everybody just flies off kilter. <laughs> Would, Their heads explode he because would, of the spin backwards. He would have gone back in time. He just killed everybody, dude. <laughs> yeah. The great idea. It's like uh, remember on Ferris Bueller when uh, his buddy takes his dad's Ferrari, yeah, and then he puts mileage on it, and so he's like, oh, oh, yeah. in order to get the mileage We're off, we're gonna go backwards. We just have to drive the car backwards. <laughs> Sound logic. <laughs> it doesn't work. So you're saying I shouldn't order my three day safety kit? No, you uh, should. <laughs> well, if you already ordered the Mayan calendar one, I feel like yeah, yeah. sure. No, you should have a double up. You, actually, you don't have a, a kit like an emergency kit. I don't. Really? No. Oh yeah, you should. You have one, right, Justin? Yeah, I have just like a little first aid and a little survival kind of setup, like with water and shit and lights. And what, is, what does that look like? It's just basic. It's just like, uh, you like know, a, a few mag water. lights. <laughs> yeah, like some <laughs> like, distilled like water. What the fuck is that going to do? <laughs> yeah, <there's> nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. Some chlorine pills. Yeah. No, you, no I, you, you need water, yeah. canned food. Uh, you need a gun. Water. Thank you. Yeah. That's actually, that's true. It is. That's I mean, one of the most important you things. You as the gun is going to get all the shit. If shit goes down, like really goes down, where you can't, emergency services can't reach you. Which is, which has happened? It happened uh, with Hurricane Katrina. There were people who were stranded for yeah, days, and then the next thing that happens is looting, right? Looting, yeah, yeah. yeah so you you want to go survival gun. mode, yeah? Or let's say you didn't pack your emergency kit, like you like let's say you didn't pack your emergency right. kit. Your neighbor, yeah. did. but I but I got <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> ding, yeah. I got neighbor, my I got my gun. All the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, hey. Ding dong, hey yeah. neighbor. I think yeah. I remember. Did you pack a safety saying, kit because yeah. I forgot mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. How you doing? Yeah. Good to see you're okay. Uh, I'll take that can of tuna. Uh, see, you have a lot of tang here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna use yeah. that. Do you know that? Do you know where the emergency, uh, natural emergency stores of water are in your house? Because there are places that you can get water in case of an emergency. Let's say you lose your water. There's a place you can get water. It's, Toilet. Yeah, Ooh, the, the, the tank. Me. That's mm. right. The top of the tank, not the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Unless somebody does Unless the upper, somebody decker. upper deckers you. Yeah, exactly. They, oh. I thought I heard too that like toilet water is like as clean or cleaner than any other water that you got running through. On the tank. Yeah. Yeah, the top tank, not yeah. the to- not the bowl. I wow. feel like the, I feel I like the bowl looks nicer. 
Huh? The bowl looks nicer. Mm, it's probably got stuff in it. Oh. Oh, the top looks worse. What do you mean? My the- bowl doesn't look nicer. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know your bowl doesn't look nicer. His, his bowl looks like it's it was. I, fo- I, followed, you again. I followed you again this morning. Yeah. His, his, what, his bowl looks like there's been a car chase. You yeah. know, that they just did burnouts. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, Whoa. like on the back roads. Yeah, where somebody you know flushed I mean? a bowl of chili. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like on the, on the dirt back roads in the south. That's oh. disgusting. Yeah. Stop it, dude. That's so terrible. Stop but anyway, Anyway, yeah, you need to have an emergency, uh, like a emergency gun. I guess is the only thing that you need. Yeah. Oh, man. Hey, guess what? I am fucking pumped about right now. Oh, whoa! Is it is it the thing that I was right about again? <laughs> no. What is yes, it? it is. What is it? What were you right about? Are you going to talk about your the chili pad? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have been what waiting. Do you mean you're right on it. I got that. I'm the one that hooked that oh, up. You, oh, you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You I, seek them out. Yeah. I got Don't be st- stealing credit from Taylor. Uh, yeah. Oh my god, this is yeah. terrible. Really? Yeah. Hundred yeah, percent. No, you were the one that sent him on that. I sent. It I to remember this. Hundred percent. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, of course. So at our last event in Manhattan. um, Somebody asked a question about, I don't remember what they asked, something about our sleep. sleep. Yeah, something about our sleep. And I was only on like day three of using the chili pad. And we weren't, we hadn't even like finalized the contract. Or we're, they weren't even official sponsor yet. And I said, I know Taylor's going to be mad about this, but I got to fucking share it with all you guys in person. So if you're listening and you were at the, at the Manhattan event, you know this already. But holy shit, uh, the chili pad is the real deal. And I'm absolutely in, in love with this thing. So uh, I, I just have right now, you know, Taylor got uh, a few of them shipped over to us for us to try. And I got mine hooked up first. And I've been using it for the last week. And this thing is fucking badass. So it's a mattress pad that goes just right over your mattress, right? So then my, and then my sheet goes over the top of it. And then it reminds me of the, the, those units, like if you had like knee surgery or whatever, that have the, the cool water running through. Yeah, and this oh, yeah. Is, so it's EMF. There's no EMFs in it. It's all water cool. <clears throat> yeah. It's so, not, it's not, it doesn't have like wires or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, no, right, exactly. So it's all water, and it's, in the, it's so thin that you don't, you don't feel it or really notice it at all underneath your mattress, and it's really comfortable. And then it's hooked to this, this cooling unit, and this cooling unit is uh, controllable. Now, they, Chili Pad is, there, is the original one, and then they have Uller, which is the newest one that just- That's the one that you're using with the app on the phone? Yeah, right? so that's what just got released. Ula. And that, you have an app, so you can control this thing. Now, what I do, like, like today, it, it's set to kick on about four o'clock at my house and, and drop it down to about 58 degrees, which is where I found that I like love this thing. And what's neat, and and it took a few days before I was like, is this really fucking making this big of a difference? Yeah. Because you guys know, and I've talked about this on the show before, that I get up on a regular one to three times. So annoying. Night. Anybody who shares a hotel with you, <laughs> room with you. So he, this is like, if you've listened to this. like a rock, so that if you, me. If you've listened to the show for any length of period of time, you know this because Adam talks about it. He talks about how he has the bladder of a child and he has to wake up. Every night, one or two times every single night. Right. So now I've assumed that this has everything to do with my bladder and peeing and because for 37 years of my life, that this is just how it's been for me. But what has happened since I've been using this thing is I have had full nights of sleep almost every single night. The other night I actually woke up one time. But every other night... Now, to be clear, you still pee. You just don't wake up anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's I sleep the entire night and... I think what it must have something to do with is, you know, I run hot and when I get under my sheets, even if it's cool in my house, eventually those sheets warm up so much with my body temperature that the the heat wakes me up. That makes me probably have to go well, pee. Well, the human body, the things that dictate, uh, that help dictate your, whether you sleep or wake up are light. We already know that, right? So if it's bright in, in your room, it's hard to go to sleep. If it's dark, your brain gets the signal to go to sleep and so and obviously because your our bodies evolved with the with the sun rising and, and, and falling and, and setting the other thing that helps dictate sleep is temperature it naturally cools down at night and it naturally warms up as the sun rises and so cool temperatures in your bed and this is widely accepted this is actually uh, one of the most uh, in terms of sleep one of the most accepted uh, things that can positively contribute to quality sleep and what I mean by quality is People sleep, they go to sleep faster. So studies will show that when people use devices like this to cool down their bed, they, they fall asleep 95% faster. So the time it takes you to go to sleep is cut in half. And then the deep sleep, the deep sleep stages 
and some people doubles. So, so this this is what I'm feeling right now. Is I'm as soon as I'm hitting the pillow, I'm I'm out mm. and I'm out hard. And then I wake up and and I'm feeling like I've gotten sleep that I've never had before in my life. So this is tripping me out, like how amazing this is. And don't get me wrong, like I've talked about all the great things that uh, I've noticed with the the blue blockers before bed, like that stuff has made a difference. Turning all my electronic, all those things have helped out. Nothing has made as big of a difference as this thing has right now. Like yeah. it's, I'm mm. getting some of the best sleep. Now in my here's life. the cool thing with the Uller is that you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, you can program it so that it slowly starts to warm up when you want to wake up. Yes, and so this is a piece I haven't done yet. So what I haven't done is because I've just, I mean, it's only been a week that I've been playing with all the settings and I've been finding the perfect temperature that I like it like it at. Because at first I wasn't sure like how it how it regulates this and if like if I would still naturally heat it up when I get in there but no whatever temperature you set it, it at keeps it at that right and so when I get in there of course my body's 90 something degrees so the thing is working all night long to just manage it at whatever temperature I set so I set it at 58 mm -hmm. it keeps underneath my sheets this cool 58 degrees even when it's warm in my house yeah it's rad because I noticed the only times I really wake up is when I my body temperature has woke me up like I, I get up and I'm like hot and I have to open the window or I have to like you know go get some cold water or something and that's the pain in the ass well so, it's does it have two, it has two sides too right so I'm only using one right now so I'm only using the single one side. Yeah, they but have they, they have all kinds of models. So they, they have they, they have models that like like the one guy like one side can make theirs certain temperature, the other side can make. So theirs. yeah, they have levels, right? As far as uh, this thing can range from, uh, I think the cheapest model is like three hundred all the way up to fifteen hundred dollars based off of what size bed you have. If you want both of them controlled, if you want the Uller one, so so you uh, can't control both with one pad, or you have yes, to use two. That's okay. the, that's like the the Cadillac, right? Which is what yeah. I want to get next. Now that I know that I love it. And yeah. I, so Katrina can, because Katrina likes it way warmer. Yes. So I could keep her at like That's 80 degrees and I could drop me to 58 in the same bed. Wow. Yeah. yeah so, so I knew this yeah, would be right. a game changer because, so this is how I heard about it. I had gotten a couple, because we I talk about sleep a lot and I had a couple DMs of people who were asking me, what do you think about the chili pad? And I thought, chili pad, what is it? What is he, what is he talking about? So after I had a few Sounds DMs. spicy. Yeah, yeah. After I had a few DMs. I uh, uh, I noticed that uh, Greenfield, Ben Greenfield, uh, talks about them. So I said, okay, let me ask Ben about it. And Ben raved about it. So I did my research on it, and that's when I got the uh, I got us hooked up with the CEO, and I sent that information over to Taylor to work something out for us because I know the science, and I know that uh, you know, the things that I was worried about was, is this, in a, is this going to have EMF, or is it like an electric blanket? It's not. It's cooled by water. Is it uh, produce a lot of noise to where you're not able to sleep or whatever? No, creates it creates white noise. Yeah, it creates white noise, which is actually helps people sleep. Um, and then I looked at the studies, and the studies are are remarkable. So I knew it would be a total game changer. Um, and I'm glad that you tried it first because yeah. you easily have the worst sleep out of all of us. You've always had sleep problems, dude. Totally. Oh no, it's been it's been amazing. So uh, it's been a while since I've been pumped. I know we're very particular about everybody that we bring on as a partnership, but I'm like no. pumped. About now it. here's yeah. the here's the thing that I'm very proud about with Taylor is he negotiated that we have the highest uh, discount. Code. I know. Oh yeah. So so because they I know Chili Pad it works with other companies. Uh, but our discount code is that gives you the biggest uh, discount. Yeah, well, I just set mine up. I mean, it was like a heat wave through here. So I wish I had it going like uh, a couple days ago, but uh, I got mine all set up and ready to go. So I'm going to start checking it out and messing around with the settings tonight. Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't gotten mine yet because I'm waiting for the king size one that so Taylor's got me. No, I can't wait coming. to hear your guys' feedback on it because it's been game changer. Oh, for yeah, me. dude. So, so I got some mind blowing information for you. <laughs> Ooh, is it no. blowing? Is it really blowing? No, you know what? So this is the kind of shit that I live for. I literally live for this kind of stuff where something is so accepted as common knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's a, either a statistic or some kind of information that's so accepted that we don't even think to question it. It's just that's oh yeah, that's true. That's you know, that's what we believe. So like years ago when I first realized that eating small meals throughout the day didn't speed up your metabolism. I remember what that did to me. It blew my mind because for at least half of my fitness career as a professional, you know, personal trainer, I didn't even question that. I thought it was, it was so true that it wasn't even in my mind to even yeah. think to ask whether or not it was true. It's just it just was. And uh, you know, a lot I've I've learned a lot of those things throughout fitness and I love it because I can 
no longer am I, you know, in the dark about something. Well, there was something that was shared with me that I thought, no way that's true. And I looked it up. So I went to a, uh, recently, you know, Jessica and I have been going to different churches and listening to people speak or whatever. And, and part of the reason why I go is I like to see really, really good speakers. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these live events and, um, I was unaware of this, but some of the best speakers you'll find locally are pastors and people that speak at churches. Yeah. They're just very, very, forget the religion part, forget the what they're saying. If you're trying to learn and study how to speak in front of a crowd, which I'm trying to do because of all of our live events, you, you can go online and watch you know, really, really mm. good speakers. But if you want to see someone live, some of the best places are some of these churches. Well, half of their seminary revolves around teaching them this uh, certain trait. Well, these people practice, they practice, they speak yeah. in front of large audiences. Like one of the, one of the churches I went to, the, the crowd was at least six, 700 people. So this guy's speaking in front of that many people, you know, several times a week for years, of course he's going to be good. And so he does a great, anyway, so I went to one and he was talking about marriage. Obviously it's a church, so they bring up these types of topics. <clears throat> and he talked about the statistic, what percentage of marriages end in divorce? Go ahead and shout it out. We've been told 50%, but I've actually heard false. that's not... Yeah, I've heard that's false. False. Yeah. I've totally, heard. totally false. It was never right, in fact. That was a Who's myth. propagating that? That was a myth. Currently, at this point right now, uh, if you get married today, the odds that you'll get divorced is more like uh, 25%, 20 to 25%. That, that low. Way lower no than way. the 50% number. Divorce rates were peaking right around the 70s, and the 50% number came from people projecting where they think it's going to go if it continues to grow. But what ended up happening is it peaked and then it stayed at a certain point and then it started to drop. And right now, over the last couple decades, we're seeing divorce rates continue to fall. So has this just been like information that just keeps getting repeated without like rechecking it? Totally. Like, yeah. Totally. And so we believe it to be common knowledge. And this really huh. infuriates me because- yeah. I, you know, I've, I'm divorced, right? I'm a divorced person. I know what that statistic can do to people. And I think what it does is it either makes you feel like, okay, you know, everybody gets divorced. What's the big deal? Right. I might as well just do whatever. I feel like that statistic will even encourage some people to think that that may be a better option when you know that, wait a minute, most people do make it. Or, or what about this? Maybe it prevents people from getting married because they're so afraid of that statistic. I mean, mm -hmm. one out of two, that's a terrible oh, sure. statistic. Well, that's but part, one, of, you know, <clears throat> part of, part of IGEN uh, dove into these, these, these statistics and, and show that the, the divorce rate has declined and rapidly declined over the last two decades. The argument that they make is that because people have become more and more aware that how high the divorce rate was or could be, it's made people wait to get married until they're older, and that's starting to... Well, so here's... So I did a lot of reading because this blew my mind, right? So I did a lot of reading, and here's what the experts in the field, hmm. a lot of experts in the field think happened. You had a very, very large and uh, necessary women's movement that really took off after the birth control pill, um, and that caused a lot of problems, mainly because the defined roles of marriage... <clears throat> shifted. And anytime there's a big societal shift, we have to kind of readjust. And they think that's a lot of the reason why you had uh, issues because, you know, men and women were had different ideas of what, you know, marriage was supposed to be or what, you know, how it was supposed to turn out mm -hmm. based off of what they thought, you know, because of how their parents experienced it and now things are different. We've now settled into it and the reality is that when people make that commitment to get married, the the odds are 7 or so out of 10 marriages will stay together and will actually last. And that's good news to hear that. You know what huh. I mean? Because it's sad to think that 50% ended. It's also another, like people use that argument about polyamorous relationships and, you know, well, you know, half of all marriages end in divorce. And that's obviously because we're not supposed to be married to one person. Oh, that's a big, big, uh, uh, you know, argument they lean on. Absolutely. And it's totally false. Now, second and third marriages, <laughs> The divorce rate much higher, um, and they and, and I read about that as well, and they think that has more to do with the complications that are usually uh, accompany right. second and third marriages because people are bringing other kids into the marriage, and then they have exes to deal with. Oh, I would stuff. think that has a lot to do with people getting divorced. Always think it's the other person, and in reality, there's a lot of shit they need to work on themselves. Well, and it, they don't ever fix that, and they go marry somebody else. Totally. If you yeah. if you wanna if you want to have a self selection bias of people who are likely to divorce, just pick people who've already divorced. Yeah. And if if they don't fix their own issues, which 
probably contributed to their first divorce, and they go into a second marriage, a third marriage. Obviously, right. The rate well, goes up. Well, I think quite a bit. too to your point of the iGen, like um, seeing like back back when a lot of people were getting married, like that was the option as when you're younger. Like it's like I gotta get married and I gotta like establish this. Like as it was a thing that was like expected of you versus you know waiting and realizing like this is actually what I want. You know, and having maturity going into it, and both partners being in a mature state and making a decision as adults. I think. That has to have a factor. Well, I that, I subscribe to that, right? So I listened to, I read a lot of the the statistics that were in that book, and I think that makes a lot of sense to me because I know where I was at as a eighteen year old, a twenty five year old, a thirty year old, and Dude, now if I would have married my like high school girlfriend, I've been fucked. Right? Yeah, yeah. And and let me tell you, I thought I was in love at eighteen, nineteen years old. I mean, I thought I could marry that girl. I thought I was going to be with. Well, her you the rest probably of my life. were in love, but it was uh, at a different capacity. You were not your full self. So it was for that you know version of Adam, which right. was nothing right. compared to. Well, what I mean, I'm still the same. We're all the same people. You've just continued to grow and right. learn, right. right? And and there's certain th- your values tend to change as you get older and you mature. And so I would think that that would be the one of the biggest uh, ch- changes in the in that number of declining would be mm-hmm. people just flat out waiting till they're older, wiser, more mature, a better version of themselves, grown more, matured more, values have changed a little bit different than when you were 17, 18 years old. That that's personally what I think. But I had heard that before, Sal, uh, and I know we were regurgitating the 50% 75 well, so, of the day. So but. people have been waiting longer and longer to get married, but I but part of it is less to do in my opinion with we we take it more seriously because I don't believe that to be true. In fact, I think people take marriage less seriously now mm. than they did 50 or 60 years ago. I think the reason why we wait longer now is because adolescence has only stretched out. Okay, so if you go back they, to They make that case also. Yeah, cuz if so you I, if you go back to like my grandfather's generation um, you know, you, an eighteen-year-old man was a man. You took an eighteen-year-old from right. You were 19, out. You were out on your own. You were living you a full-time job. Oh, yeah. job. Yeah. You busted your ass. You no, probably I, started I probably smoking. Involved I, in I, a war. Igen yeah. makes this case too. They make they they make that argument as one of the contributors to it. Also, is that adolescence and, and their stats to prove that is completely stretched out. The age that kids are getting driver's license, the age that they're leaving home. So, yeah. of course, that would also naturally, per, you know, push out the the marriage. But the, one of the things for sure is that you can. People are aware of that. People are aware of how, and even at twenty five percent or between twenty five and thirty percent, whatever the number is for divorce rate, it's still a decent number of people divorce, and so that's enough for people to be like, oh, let me, it is let me wait a little longer. Here. It is because uh, you know committing to anybody is, fu- and I don't care if it's business or marriage or whatever, it's fucking hard. But look, I've met people who have had terrible times. You know, I had a friend who, who whose husband, oh no, sorry, wife, had an affair. Then that almost got them separated and divorced. Then he had an affair. That almost crushed them. Then they went to counseling, worked it out. None of the happiest, you know, couple. And of course, their kids now are uh, older now and they're, they had their first grandchild. I, I think it's it's a very, but this, this, this statistic of 50%, it, it's kind of nefarious this like per, that we're pushing that see people seem to be pushing this false narrative mm. and it's like why why are you why do you want people to believe so many people like you, you, there's such a high rate of divorce when it's totally false yeah. why are we promoting that so much that's it, interesting it is very interesting kind of infuriating now where yeah, did you find the stats to counter that argument uh, everywhere if you if you google uh 50 per, the, the half of all marriages end in divorce myth you'll find a hundred articles, all of which, many of which come from reputable sources, uh, whether it be like CNN or Fox or, you know, uh, Psychology Today or whatever. It's it's never, it wasn't a true, it, it's been a myth for, and we've known it's been a myth for a long time. Yeah, we just that. haven't learned that. It's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, no, that is yeah, crazy. Anyway. I, I think 25 seems even low, though. I would I would guess it's somewhere between 25 and 50. I thought that's what I read. I thought I read somewhere like 37 or 40%. No, no, no. It's, <clears throat> it's around, they said around 70%, 70, 75% uh, is what I was reading of, of marriages stay together, which makes me feel a lot better. And here's a deal. You know, uh, people talk about, is it natural for two people to be together forever or whatever? The thing about humans that makes us special, one of the things that makes us special among all animals is that we rise above our natural instincts and we do things that we find that in, that make us better, that encourage fulfillment, that uh, make life more 
worth living. It's also our our struggle, right? Because we have this this ego that we've developed and this consciousness to analyze things. But there's a lot of things that we do that are counter natural. Um, you know, like if if I have a cake in front of me and I don't eat the whole thing, that's counter my nature. My nature is eat the fucking cake. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and and not to rain on the the your parade here with the statistics, but I would actually. There's got to be, I, I w- and look this up because it'd be interesting to see what these numbers are. Uh, maybe it's 30% of the people uh, end in divorce, but how, what percentage of people stay together and there's infidelity? I mean, how many people are still in a marriage but then cheating on each other? You know, Sure, so, so what percentage so, of marriages are perfect? Yeah. Zero. Right. So, I mean, that the reason why that doesn't phase me at all is because I'm not saying it's good or right. it's right. What I'm saying is it's difficult, but- People work it out, and yeah. most people work it out, and that's a good that's a good thing to know. I, I think I agree. Yes, I think. agree with that. Definitely, dude. Have you guys uh, and Doug? I wanted to ask Doug because I figured if anybody in this room knew what this was, I thought maybe Doug. Might. Doug, are you familiar with mukbang? <laughs> I, Why would you think I'm familiar with mukbang for five well, for five dollars? Yeah, sounds good, kind of kinky. You get it's, a good mukbang. it's Korean. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's it's a it's a Korean word that means eating and broadcasting. So it's like this sensation, and it's been happening for like a decade. It's now making its way over to the States and becoming popular over here. And there's tons of these YouTubers that have millions and millions of subscribers and viewers. You guys can YouTube it right now, M-U-K-B-A-N-G. And the, the thing that I've, I, I watched a bunch, I got sucked down the, the, into the rabbit hole this morning when I was reading this article about it. And it's like this, this new sensation. You guys know those... Uh, those Instagrams and those YouTubes of like you just people playing with like Play Doh or where, and uh. you find yourself staring at it and watching it. Right, right. Okay, it's it's the same concept only it's people smacking their lips and eating food. Oh, oh it sounds horrible. I, I I agree. I told, but what what it is there's there's science to support this that there's these pleasure sounds of the the eating of the food and us watching it that stimulates us and sucks us into wanting to watch this. Now, you know some people that would do the opposite. Um, uh, Jessica is one of those people. If she hears me too. sounds... Oh, me too. I, me too. I I'm, dis- I'm disgusted by it. That's why you guys don't sit next to me when I eat. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I feel I'm with- like it's the same thing as watching people pop pimples, right? Yeah, it's weird. It's, some people like that stuff. Girls. Uh, yeah. Girls like that. Sounds horrible. That, weird, weird, right? Yes. So this is like this this YouTube sensation. And I guess it's been going for a while. I, I'm just, just now becoming privy to it. But I watched them this morning, and it's just... It's weird shit. It's like a stack of noodles, fried chicken, and they're just they're they're talking to the camera and they're eating this food and they're talking about it. And they have millions of people that are yeah. tuning in and making millions of dollars. Yeah, off there's of this. a lot of there's a lot of these uh, pages on Instagram that are similar to that where you're just watching a knife cut through like kinetic sand or someone squishing things that are squishy or people like Doug said popping pimples. Those and by the way, I didn't even know those pages existed until Jessica showed Dr. me. Doctor Pimple Popper, millions and millions of followers, and it's literally a close up of someone, a doctor maybe, <laughs> squeezing shit out of a pimple, which I find absolutely repulsive. That's the worst possible thing you could show me on a, a screen. But Jessica loves it, and when we were on, we were on our, when we were in Manhattan Beach, she was talking about it with Courtney. And Courtney's like, oh my God, I love it too. And they were both fucking talking about how much they love watching people's pimples getting smashed on Instagram. And they were sharing their favorite pimple popping That's pages. That's weird. That's a girl thing. Why? Well, here's my theory. Chimp, uh, yeah, chimp dude. Stuff. Dude, you, you ever see chimps like groom each other? I think I think girls have that natural, that, that old instinct, you know, to want to like clean us and prune us and shit because you ever have girlfriends want to squeeze your pimples no no absolutely yeah i have i've never desired to squeeze no a girlfriend's pimple never or guy's pimple anybody's no. pimple never <laughs> but girls seem to have this weird instinct to want to do that it's kind of weird right? and you think it's an animal instinct that goes all the way back to like fuck yeah watch monkeys wh- do when they try they pull like little lice off each other and they yeah that, but is it a sex other? thing is it only the female monkeys that do it to the males or do the males do it to males i think the, I think and why have we evolved out of it and women continue to do it i think because they did it to the children probably and they did it to the mates uh, to the males while we sat there and i don't know <laughs> <laughs> whatever dude anyway. now listen spotify dude i've been telling everybody uh, about this company for quite some time. Not like they're fucking new or anything like that, but uh, the stuff that they're doing, I think, is really fascinating. And I read this article this morning about Spotify's emotional surveillance. What? Yeah. So they had, they, okay, in 2014, Spotify acquired a company called EcoNest. 
and Spotify began diving deep into how people generate and listen to playlists. So to come to find out like our daily mood completely affects how and what we listen to, which I think that's kind of obvious, right? Yeah. So, you guys, mm. so like they when, like when you when you broke up with your girlfriend and you only listen to country afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Why you sell me out like that? That dude? was a great story. Why you sell me that out? That like, is a great story. Why you I was like, we listen to stained. That was like, around the shower for like. It was hour. around the fire campfire with family talking. <laughs> 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 roll me under the bus I'm like on that. the outside. <laughs> <laughs> Who was I sharing that with? You were you were talking. To Jessica, it was Jessica. Yeah, because right. she likes country. Yeah, and you said that I do too. That you got into country because you you were dating a girl. Right. She loved country. You hated country. Right. And then you broke up with her, and you just listened to country to torture yourself. I did. <laughs> yeah. It's like 17 years old when I did that. Yeah. So you fucking rat me out. It's like great. That. But yeah. anyway, so so what they're what they're doing is they're trying to figure out like what like your so, emotions. Yeah, and your patterns, right? So they Spotify has these different lists that are like uh you know mood lifter and, and happy happy whatever and they're paying attention to how everybody is listening to their music now wh why does that matter well it's be i guess it's becoming a, a commodity for uh, for advertisers so it's very valuable to them to know what kind of mood you're oh in based off the music you're listening to know how to advertise to you oh my god crazy right so when you're sad i could see this now it knows oh shit <laughs> You know, Adam's listening Kenny to Kenny G's coming on. Yeah, Adam's listening to country again or whatever. Right. And you're sad. And so now you're getting ads for like chocolate. Yes. <laughs> or some shit. Or, yeah, or things that would up, make you feel uplifting. Yeah. Or Beer. That, yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. Huh. That is fucking brilliant. It's smart, but fucked up. Bro, this is where we're at. We are heading in this time. I know we brought up the whole car data thing the other day. Now Spotify, like everything, all of our patterns and behaviors. This is why I totally subscribe to that theory and that weird show that I keep bringing up where the I think that the future, and this goes to Tom Bilyeu's point of everything that can be free will be free, is just you, you your data is going to be more valuable than your initial $20 of purchasing my thing. Whatever it is that I'm wow. trying to sell, knowing more detail about you is going to become way more valuable uh, for for brands. Well, here's the thing. So advertisers and marketers, their goal is to manipulate you. And, and people think of the term, when I say manipulate, they think of it as a negative thing. Mm. Um, it, it's, it can be negative, but manipulate just means... You can say get, persuade. It's a better... Yeah, yeah. Better get way. you to change your your perception. Get you to want something or not want something or think a particular way. Now, the key to manipulation... And if you study ty tyrannical governments uh, that have used propaganda and spent lots of money on propaganda and getting their citizens to believe a, a certain thing, the key is to keep the people from believing they're even be being manipulated. Right, right. To even think that you're that they're trying to change your mind. It's it was my decision. This is something that I wanted to do. So when you go buy something and you come home with it, and your wife or husband says, "Why did you get that?" You know, you want to. You, it, it's powerful for you to think. Oh, this is just what I wanted. Not well, to think, oh, it was those ads that got me to do this. You well, know? think about it. Advertising is only annoying to you as a as a person who's watching TV or as a normal as a consumer of whatever medium. It's only annoying when you're getting advertised shit you have no interest in. Mm. I'm only annoyed when I'm watching TV and a commercial comes on of something I'm totally not interested in. But if the only the commercials I saw were all the things that I was most interested in, boy, does that change the game? Yeah. And so that's where we're heading. We're heading in this time yep. where you're why waste time advertising to people that probably aren't going to buy your product anyways? We want to know we, we're going to get so much data on you mm. that we're going to make sure we serve up only the ads, only the things that you potentially would want. Whoa. Whoa, that's going to be crazy. I know. And you think you combine things like Spotify, it's, it's the gonna car. Know, it's going to know when you're horny, your ad's going to pop up. Totally. Or, yeah, ugly girls in your neighborhood want to have sex or whatever. <laughs> but by the way, those are actual ads that you see on some of those sites, which I think- well, they, They're brilliant. Yeah, yeah, they're brilliant because they're believable, right? Well, yeah. it's interesting. I was thinking about Brain FM in this whole process of like how like effective that is and how much like it can alter and change your mood or whether you're focused in meditation. But I, I see that expanding too in terms of like you know uplifting your your mood or bringing you down a bit and uh well, you know how they're going to be able to use that in the future did you guys know that and I, I think this is correct if i'm not mistaken that there are laws against subliminal advertising if i'm not mistaken mm. so there were studies done a long time ago that showed that if you were watching a movie 
And while that movie was going on, if a single frame flashed in front of you of like Coke or hot dog or something like that, that that it, it more people went and bought Coke and bought hot dogs. That's in that Brad Pitt movie. Which one? Where the the, the cigarette uh, pops up in the middle and it's so it's like split second, like in the middle. Fight of, Club. Fight Club. No, 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 not Fight they Club. They showed that in Fight Club uh, too. Oh, they did. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, oh, they yeah. did. In, maybe, oh, in Fight Club, there's there's many scenes like that. If you actually are, there's like tits that just pop up out of nowhere for two seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Really? You're like whoa. Yeah. I don't if you're that. if you're uh um if you like Easter eggs, Fight Club is one of the best movies because yep. so, you could start to pick up on and little. You can see nuances. Tyler Durden or whatever the guy's name flash. is flash and like yeah. know, shows him but but uh i believe it's illegal to do subliminal advertising because a long time ago studies showed that it actually was somewhat effective and people got freaked out and they passed laws saying that you're not allowed to advertise in that way didn't that happen mm-hmm. with like grocery store music too because i think they used to do that with at the grocery store they'd play certain music that made you want to buy certain things and that w- they that used to be a strategy that they no longer can do really? I, thought, oh, I yeah. believe that oh yeah, i think I'm they sure. still do that don't yeah. they well they they play music that makes you want to stay in the store and shop which i think that is fair game but i think before they had like subliminal messages in the music <laughs> yeah. to get you to buy well, you products. know you know that do you know how much money and uh and time has gone into the design of grocery stores and where they place products and the lighting and all that shit that you know how much money goes into all that stuff oh yeah how they display it is everything right? oh it's crazy i go into whole foods pay attention to the lighting that's above the fruit uh-huh. it's designed to make the fruit appear as absolutely vibrant and healthy as possible <laughs> you, get it, you get it home it's all brown what yeah. the fuck <laughs> it's all spotted yeah, yeah. With the strawberry's not glowing red like it wasn't <laughs> but it's it's crazy how much money that goes into this because it's it's to same thing with plates like if a restaurant serves a particular type of a plate or color plate or color of uh, uh, what is it, what is it called that they put over the table? What is it? Tablecloth. Yeah. Um, all those things influence you know your behavior and how much food you eat and stuff like that. Well, so. I think Justin's right. He got it right when he referred to us heading in the Minority Report. I mean, I think that's what's going to happen is you're just going to be walking down the street and poof, ads pop up all over the place and it's all things. How that long do you think until uh, people start to demand regulation against uh, these types of ads? I don't uh, think so. Yeah. I, I I mean. Personally, I, at least I don't care. Like that, and that's why too. I'm also somebody who doesn't get all freaked out about them watching our data and watching our patterns because it, it, it's not the government who's doing it who gives a shit about who I am or what I'm doing. It's people that want to sell shit to me. Let's be mm-hmm. honest. Yeah. Money is what drives all of this research. So a, a major, I should say, ninety percent of yeah. it's coming from from people trying to make money off of selling you things and. If it means that I'm going to get advertised things that I'm more interested in, I'm. It just what it's going to do. It puts more responsibility on the consumer. Like you now need to have restraint because it's going to be really tough to say no to the things that you like and when it's being thrown at it you. It would be great if you could block like what was wasn't working, right? But you allowed what did make sense to you. So like they could still advertise like that because it's like I do want that product actually. Mm-hmm. But you know the ones that were like, dude, this is fucking annoying. Like they're not going to make money because you're you're pissed that they're they're marketing to you like that. Yeah, so. never show me this again or yeah, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah I, you know I'm I'm with you, Adam. Um, but I do worry because I see what um, you know processed foods has done to people's health. Uh, we have a choice, you know, to choose to eat this food or not. But nonetheless, it's so powerful in how it's engineered. It's caused uh, a health epidemic, and it's taken a few generations for people to even realize what the hell's going on. So I think with marketing, it's going to be interesting. I'm not worried about getting advertised things that I want. I'm worried about advertisers figuring things out about my physiology that get me to to want what they have to sell. Oh, that's coming. Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. No, that's... Well, yeah, to be manipulated or persuaded to go in a different... I mean, that's their job. Their job is to figure that out. All this data, they're they're, they're gathering it to do a better job at that. Because people are not... It's not hard to manipulate people. Right. They did no. those studies a right. long time ago that showed uh, like people's uh, fear of shark attacks spiked after the movie Jaws came out and people believed... <clears throat> That there were more shark attacks happening because newspapers started reporting more shark attacks. But the reality is shark attacks have been the same mm-hmm. every single year. Same thing with crime. If I if I ask the average person, do you think it's more dangerous today than it was 30 or 40 years ago? People would say absolutely, but it's not. It's actually, this is like the safest decade in, in decades. It's been, uh, crime has been declining for a long time. Child abductions have been declining for a long time. But people would believe opposite, uh, and and could how could that belief be manipulated to get us to want to buy or vote packages. 
or huh? Buy earthquake packages. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like we said earlier, that's crazy. Anyway, uh, speaking of s- s- along these lines, did you guys know that Beverly Hills just banned the sale of all tobacco products in the city? No, really. Yeah, the city of Beverly Hills now has banned what all tobacco, all like s- even like uh, um, packed um, pipes and, and cigars and all that stuff. All or tobacco just like- products. That's so crazy. Yeah, Why? so no tobacco, no cigarettes, no e-cigarettes with uh, nicotine, nothing. Because you know Beverly Hills says that they want to be a healthy city and blah blah blah. I mean, we're talking about. Beverly Hills. Right, cocaine's fine, <laughs> cigarettes not so much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That's We're, a joke, dude. Yeah, there's a plastic surgeon in every corner. Yeah. But uh, but no, but no cigarettes uh, are, are banned. Uh, wow. Sale, selling them is banned. Man, you that has to be, uh, that they're going to take a huge hit financially. Well, maybe, or maybe it wasn't doing that big of a deal anyway. And so they're just like, this will look good. Oh, get out of here, dude. I don't know. Mm. Are How you many kidding people me? smoke in Beverly Hills? Probably a fuck ton. You think so? Sure. Yeah. Mm, I would sure. think a lot, yeah. Not a lot of people smoke in, 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 well, I guess a lot of people do smoke, but in comparison, way less people smoke in, in California than in other places. I'm sure it's been on the decline, but like a place like that, I would imagine a lot of people at parties would smoke yeah. and, you know. I just think it's funny how attitudes have changed. 30 years ago, if you were walking down the street of San Francisco with a cigarette, nobody cared. If you had a joint, everybody would freak out. It's the reverse now. Yeah. You walk down the streets of San Francisco. Where are we? I saw, this is so weird. <laughs> I saw it the other day, dude. I, I was walking in the city, and there was a guy with a cigarette, and he must have gotten 10 dirty looks from people. And literally, five steps behind him, there's a dude with a joint. Nobody yeah. says shit. You might as well just punch a baby. Yeah. That's, that's, you know what I mean? <laughs> Smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, but no, it's uh, it's crazy. I wonder how many other cities are going to follow suit with that, something like that. That's interesting. Yeah, right? it's uh, To me, it's, it's you know what do they call it? Virtue signaling. Like, hey, look at us. We care so much about, yeah. you know, health. When, yeah, you really don't. You no. know, you just want people to think you do. You're trying yeah. to look cool. Well, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's, a, it's better, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if it's a, do you think it's really a virtue signaling thing? I think it's, I mean, somebody, somebody there pushed that, that through to happen. And it's probably for, for the better. I, I look, mean, I'm of not, course, I'm a health and fitness, you know, enthusiast. And so I'm going to say, yeah, it's bad to smoke on a regular basis, but I'm also a pro. You choose for yourself. Yeah, do person. whatever you want. Cigarettes are already so heavily regulated um, that then outright banning them. You know what'll end up happening? Here's what's going to happen: Tobacco is mm-hmm. getting to the point now where it's starting to be cool again. Why? Because we're so against it. Mm-hmm. So now that marijuana is becoming legal, and that you're going to see kids want to smoke less weed, but you're going to see more kids want to have cigarettes because it's the more taboo thing. You know. So I, I don't know how how good. To ban the actual sale is going to be. That's in, a good a point. City. That's a good point, and I wouldn't argue with that. I, yeah. I think that's. I mean, they've already proven that. Like that's what happens with every generation mm-hmm. that comes up, right? Whatever is the norm, or whatever everybody else, the generation before was doing, they they revolt, go the other direction. Yeah, it's not really that cool anymore. I was just listening to some '90s, uh, old '90s rap and hip hop, and and like half of it was about smoking weed. Yeah, and I wonder if it's going to keep stay that way because it's not that it's not as well, taboo Cypress anymore. Hill will never stop I know that much <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how old are those guys now I don't know they're old but there's like 30 years or something they've been like talking about weed and it's still like that like is, you look on their Instagram page it it's like, like still just weed like all these weed videos uh, and like, yeah. I was insane in the membrane that's what I was listening to the hey, other day hey man it's part of the brand Good I guess stuff. dude did, I didn't tell you guys but my my cousin did an Everly, Everly Well testosterone test yeah and then he started following some of our advice for sleep. I know we talked about sleep earlier, so I just thought of this. He started following our advice for sleep, so he started doing a, um, you know, an hour before bed. He he turned off the lights and used candles, or he used uh, like a salt lamp, or you know, or whatever. So it's really really dim in his house, or he used blue blue light blocking glasses. He start, he cooled down his room, black got blackout uh, shades for his room, and basically just you know made an effort to try to get better sleep. Did this for two months, got his testosterone levels checked again, and they rose twenty percent. Whoa! Yeah. Now, wow. now, granted, his sleep wasn't great before, so it's not like he had good sleep and then oh, yeah. you know he went from good to better. He had not that good sleep, and we, we had this conversation. We were at a family party, and I was telling him uh, about you know he's asking me what can I do to impact my 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 muscle gains, my strength, and all that stuff, and I'm like, bro, no joke. I said. You know, obviously work out, obviously eat right. You know, you're doing those things. I said, I'm not going to lie, dude. I said, the most single most important thing you can do mm. 
is just take sleep seriously. That's all you got to do. Like right now you're young, you know, he's in his late twenties. You know, you, you, you just go to bed, expect to go to sleep and, and have good sleep and then wake up and you get away with it. I said, but trust me, if you take sleep seriously, go to bed at the same time every night, wake up at the same time every morning, um, try, you know, take like an hour before bed, prepare for sleep, do the things that I just talked about. I said, watch what happens to your gains. Watch what happens to your performance. And so he did that. And I told him, I said, because then he's like, oh, I'm going to try it. And, and the, you know, my cousin, he's the kind of person that if he says he's going to do something, he'll do it, which yeah. I, I enjoy. Yeah. So I gave him an Everly Well test. I said, and by the way, so do this also. Test your, t- test your testosterone now and then do this for a month or two and then test your testosterone after because obviously you're going to see if you get stronger and you get better gains and all that stuff. But I also want to see if your testosterone levels change at all. So he tested him, his testosterone, and they were in the high average. So his testosterone levels were, were, weren't bad. They were, they were decent. They were yeah. pretty good. It still went up 15%. And he told me that his, uh, his strength gains are going up and his libido has gone up since he's been getting better sleep. The hard thing, of course, is the weekends. You know, he's 29 years old or whatever. It's crazy. I feel like we're in such a bubble a lot of the times because I could totally relate a long time ago to just falling asleep and just like laying in my bed and and hope for the best. That was like my entire approach to sleep. And I I guarantee that's still like the like the majority of people like they just go to bed. It's like, oh, I guess it's time to sleep. Just turn light off and and it's going to happen because you're you're just exhausted. Yeah. So you think you're going to have good sleep because you're just crashed out. No process to it at all. No, no. So, um, no, but it raised his testosterone level. So I, uh, he ordered another Everly Well test to test his testosterone in a few more months. That's what I like about their tests is that they're inexpensive. You order, you could order like, w- w- here's what I recommend uh, to, to people. If they want to check like hormone levels, test your hormones every quarter. Mm-hmm. If you're really into like your health, uh, uh, you know, your fitness, that way you can monitor what effect, if any, changes you're making to your workout, nutrition, and sleep are having on your hormone levels. Well, that's the key, and that's how I kind of use it right now. And what's what's neat is they actually keep track of all of them. So I can go back and look like, oh, this was when I was falling maps anabolic. I was really using the red light. I was doing this. I was doing that. And then, oh, this time I wasn't doing any of these things. And then I can kind of compare and contrast like does that or what? how big of a difference does that make on my hormone levels? Mm-hmm. So I'm another 30 days out or so before I take another one. Yeah, you were on the rise. Yeah, so I'm excited to see. Now keep this in mind. Uh, let me think. Test your testosterone before your baby's born. Okay. Because that uh, was the plan. Yeah, good. Because yeah, the plan after was in about end of July. Perfect. Because then after Maximus uh, is born, um, I turned t- into a pussy. Yeah, your testosterone is going to drop. <laughs> I bet. It happened Cause, cause, to us. Yeah. No, this is an actual statistic. Yeah. They find it, it, it not joking. <laughs> Poor Adam right now. He's looking at me like, fuck. So I don't want to turn to you guys. <laughs> no, this- <laughs> no, this is a real statistic. Uh, male Men's testosterone levels drop significantly after having kids, and it's, especially during the first couple of years. And it's, I think it has to do with the increase in stress. And lack of sleep. So it'll be interesting uh, to of see. Of course. <laughs> Adam's, Adam's going to have his own separate bedroom. Yeah. All set up, you know. <laughs> hey, babe, you know. Yeah. Buzz me. Red lights going, everything. Oh, yeah, at once. Dude, I, I read a, a, a terrible article, um, Justin. I know you live uh, in the Santa Cruz area oh, and you're near the ocean. Tell me more craziness. But, well, this isn't Santa Cruz. This has to do with Monterey Bay, but it's kind of close, right? Okay. It's relatively yep. close or whatever. So they did a study on the plastic concentrations in uh, Monterey Bay, and they found uh, that there were plastic concentrations that were as high as the Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, have you guys heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch? That's where everything kind of funnels in from all the trash that's been- It's like its own island. Of just garbage. Of just garbage and plastic. Now, these are small particles of plastic that they're picking up. These are particles that are the size of a grain of rice or smaller. But nonetheless, the researchers said that it was the results were incredibly sobering, that the pollution is made up of trillions of tiny bits of debris uh, floating from near the surface to thousands of feet underwater. Now, here's the, the, the crappy part about these small, small, small particles of plastic. They're very hard to clean up. And they get consumed yeah, by fish. Eat them, yes, dude. Like little yeah, sardines and whatnot. So this made me. This is sad because Monterey Bay is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, they have one of the best aquariums. Uh, you, you can, I take my kids there at least once a year. I love their aquarium. Very very sad. But here's the crazy thing that got me thinking. I wonder at what point 
eating fish will no longer be considered healthy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, fish consume this plastic or, and it's trapped in their body. Do they know like what is the major contributor? Like who? Like what area of the world like produces the most plastic waste? In the ocean, we do China. Oh, I thought no, we did. by far. China, no, so the, the U.S. is phenomenal. Um, all things considered, we uh, put very little waste out into the ocean. We do a very very good job in comparison to other you know big economic powerhouses. Fucking China. China's terrible. <laughs> They produce a, a, a huge percentage of the the, the pollution and shit uh, that goes out uh, into the ocean, and yeah, so it's pretty sad. And it, like I said, I wonder at what point it will be you're not going to want to buy um, wild seafood because of the the plastic and shit that they that they're, it's inside their bodies. Speaking yeah, of Monterey Bay, that's crazy. Have you guys seen the show uh, Little Big Lies? Good oh, show. Netflix? Courtney's no. really into that show. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a Showtime or HBO. I forget which one it is. Reese Wizard. Yeah, yeah. Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> Wizard you, can you say that really She's fast? in it. Nicole Kidman. <laughs> She's in it. Nicole Kidman's in it. So is uh, this season you have, um, God, what's her name? She's uh, uh, like it's the tip of my tongue. Doug, would you look it up, Little Big Lies, and tell me that the, the cast is an amazing. They have a great, a great cast. It's kind of a girl show. Mm. Uh, oh, uh, Jessica was trying to get me to watch that. Oh, yeah. it's like about like somebody Moderate- accident, murdered somebody and they all covered it up or something like that. So that's that's the first season. So it's it's based out of Monterey Bay and it's uh it's a really good there's a, there's your lineup right there. That's not all of them. Either. Oh, it's got Nicole Zoe- Kidman. Yeah, Nicole Kidman. Oh, yeah. Zoe Kravitz. Yeah, yeah. Meryl it? Streep's in this year. That's who I was trying to think of. Mm. Um it's a good show to watch with your girl. It's a, it's it is more I think of on the you know Is it compelling? Yeah, yeah, that's why you like it. It's a good, it's it's gr- a good storyline. Good. I've been trying to find a show that yeah. <clears throat> Jessica and I can enjoy together. Right. That's why I'm just telling you guys. It's not. It's not the show that Game you're going to watch. Isn't but- going well. Or yeah. what? I. So here's the thing. I'm enjoying Game of Thrones. I'm in second Sweet. season. I'm starting to like it. Um, Jessica didn't like it. Doesn't like it. Oh, oh, she's done with it, huh? Yeah, and yeah. I'm. I like it. I'm not like super. I need to watch it yeah. yet, but from she's what just not into the fantasy, right? Yeah. yeah. No. No. And, and and from what you guys told me, I guess the second season is the one that really. Yeah, it gets sucks better. you in. Right? Second, yeah, third, better. yeah, for sure. It, you know, and that's one. It's one of those shows too that if you don't get, if you don't get into it early, you're fucked. Like she can never pick it up and go like, oh, let well, me. Well, I'm already having trouble yeah. following it now. That's what I do. That's yeah. why. Yeah, it's it's heavy like that. You have to be into it. You can't be like yeah. multitasking. Do you guys know how many podcasts there were for Game of Thrones? Like there was shows that popped up all over the place just trying to explain like what's been going on. Are you because, serious? Yeah, because it wow. is. It's so vast. Like there's so many characters. There's so many different subplots, like sub stories that you just get lost. Dude, I'm, so I'm actually jealous you're watching it the way you are because I, I, it's such a deep show and there's so many moving parts, so many characters going, so many storylines that it, I think it would have been, I would have enjoyed it more watching it all consecutively versus having to wait year in between seasons. Totally. How cool is that, that something became that successful that it created its own economy? Like you said, Justin, there's yeah. shows and things created that were off of it because it was so successful that you could create your own YouTube channel explaining it and have hundreds of thousands it's of almost, people. It's almost, yep. dare I say something like this, Justin? It's, like it's Star Wars. Star, yeah. Star Wars of our time. Well, of this generation, right? Like I if, caught wind of some news actually, because they're coming out with the, the last one in this, this trilogy uh, this year. And after that, it's like, well, what, what's going to, where's it going to go from there? And I heard wind that actually the uh, Game of Thrones uh, directors, producers, writers, and all that were going to get into Star Wars. So that's oh, interesting. Wow. What do you mean get into Star Wars? Like with the like with the next, like taking it to the next, uh, you know, level from there as oh, far as like where the storyline wow. goes. Yeah. Wow, that's going to be crazy. It'd be interesting. But that's like all in the works. I don't know how much it's confirmed, but that's what they've like said to the public. What have we seen with like the, the toy market and things like that? Because it, t- it seemed like it was geared more towards adults. Like Star Wars even hooked in kids, right? Like you could be a kid and really enjoy Star Wars and yeah. an adult. Uh, where Game of Thrones, I don't know if I I, I heard too much in the oh, like, toys oh, for kids. No, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely adult driven. I think too. That's what made me interested because I'm like I'm actually hoping after this 
uh, this trilogy that they'll go in more an adult directions and eliminate a lot of the little kid stuff. Oh, okay. It, that would be cool. Mm. Like, just because I, I don't know. But then again, you know, it, it's cool to have kids grow up with, with that that story. You don't want too. Ewoks anymore? No, I don't want Ewoks, man. Damn, I so want cute. Chewbacca. That was my favorite when I was a kid. What's me too, bro? <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Little dude. teddy bears. Weren't yeah. they supposed to be Chewbacca's or whatever? Yes. Wookiees. Yeah, Wookiees. Yeah, it was supposed to be a whole planet of Wookiees. Mm. So... Yeah, but they changed it. Today's Quaw is brought to you by Maps Anabolic. If you're looking to maximize your overall muscle and strength, Maps Anabolic is the perfect place to start. With a full 30-day money-back guarantee, there is absolutely zero risk. So what are you waiting for? Go to mindpumpmedia.com and get started today. It's the motherfucking Quaw. The eagle has landed. Quee-quaw. First question is from Catherine B. Fit. You have talked about why whole body workouts tend to be superior to splits, but it seems all the influencers and bodybuilders on social media utilize a body part split and look amazing. Can you speak to this as I am someone who really wants to transform my body? I can't, Just, get, I can't get past the slit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Doug. You actually, Stuck I, with me. <laughs> I started, I got it too. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing. We trained for two decades, lots of everyday people, lots and lots and lots of everyday people. Most of the clients that we trained were like you listening right now. So if you're listening right now and you think you're, not like most people, you're probably wrong. And most people respond best to full body type workouts. Now, that doesn't mean everybody does best with full body type workouts. Some people do better with a body part uh, type split. Well, let's let's talk about that. Let's break that down a little bit on why. Why why do we believe that? And and why why do we think that you're probably more like the the normal person and not like the outlier who does better with a split? Well, here so here's some of the benefits there's, of there's multiple factors that go into this. There this. are. Now, here's one factor that's important, but this one factor I'm about to say can be accomplished with a split also. And that's training frequency or how often you train each body part per week. Now, for a while there, um, it was widely you know, sold to us that you needed to train one body part and then hard and then let it rest for an entire week before hitting it again. For most people, that's not effective. You want to hit your body parts two to four times a week for best results. Now, total volume can be the same. In other words, if you're training one body part on Monday and you're waiting till Monday and you do 21 sets on that Monday... You could just split up all those sets and do three or four workouts um, during the week. So same total volume, more frequency, and that tends to give people better results. Um, it also allows you to do more effective exercises. If you're doing all 21 sets in one extra, one workout, the last, I don't know, 15 sets of your workout or so are usually comprised of easier exercises because you're fatigued. But if you split it up amongst three or four workouts, now you can choose to do the more effective exercises each time because you're you have more energy. Here's some of the other benefits of full body workouts, though, that are that are that are uh, just apply to full body workouts. When you do, when you work the whole body, or when you work a body part, you get this anabolic effect that affects that body part. But there is this systemic anabolic effect that happens as well. Studies will show that if somebody trains just their right arm, most of the muscle gain goes to the right arm. But believe it or not, a little bit of muscle gain goes to the left arm too. And there's a little bit of a muscle gain that, uh, that happens to the rest of the body. There's a systemic effect. Well, a full body workout is hitting your entire body in one workout. So you're getting more of that systemic muscle building effect. This is one of the reasons why I think when I take clients and I put them on a two or three day a week full body workout instead of a body part split, that most of them just do better. They get stronger and they build more muscle when they do that. I also think that it's... Uh more realistic uh, for consistency purposes. Uh, you rarely can you rarely find a client who can do a body part split and maintain the frequency of hitting the muscle two to three times a week. That normally requires them in the gym five or six days. Yeah, minimum yeah. five to six days, sometimes seven days a week, and maybe they can do that at, at for bouts of time for a month or two or maybe even three month stretches. 
but very few clients could ever consistently day in and day out for years train five to seven days a week every single week to maintain the frequency needed to get the most out of the the, the muscle growth so doing the full body split seems to be the the better routine for a majority of people for that reason it doesn't mean that a split can't be made and normally the the instagram people that we see that are running these splits are people that are married to the gym yeah that are in the gym seven days a week and training like their crazy. entire life yeah is, yeah is is surrounded around that and they're presenting this information so and does it work for them? I'm sure it does work. It's just interesting like to think back too, because I was in the body part split. Like that—that that was uh, something that I, I used to train um, when when I was thinking about like hypertrophy phases and like trying to go through that and uh, being introduced to the full body workout. I was I was like, no, I don't want to work legs and upper body at the same time. It's gonna suck, you know. And then you start getting through it and you realize, uh, you know, the the recovery of it. For me personally, I was like. Actually, I, I started to look forward to training my legs more because I wasn't just hammering the shit out of them that day. The leg day specifically for me, uh, I used to go crazy with that when I was doing a split and it would just, it would almost like the next workout was almost impossible. Yeah, it would cripple you for the next three to four days. You'd, yeah. be, right. you'd be hobbling around and then it would, and that's another reason why I think the the split, because you have to understand too, when you when you do a full body routine, you, you, you're not keeping the same level of volume and intensity that you would do if you were doing a split. You're reducing that. You're, it's way, way less volume per day on a, on a muscle group. Same volume per week. Yeah, per week right. it's the same, but it's, it's spread out. So then like to Sal's point, you know, and let's just use like an example like chest. Like instead of doing like I would do in the past, a chest day, which I do 15 to 25 sets of all chest and it's hammered and in the next four to five days it's sore and trying to recover. And then maybe on day five, I, I hit it again. Instead of that, I'm dividing those 15 to 25 sets over three or four days. And so I, just, I don't feel crippled afterwards. So then what it allows me to do is when I go to hit the chest on the second day, I'm not as sore, which allows me to get after it more in that workout or lift more weight, which then in turn right. ends up building more muscle. And studies show that the, the muscle protein synthesis signal, which when we measure that, that shows that your body is building muscle, that signal spikes um, after a workout, and then it drops very quickly after about 48 to 72 hours. Now, if you're advanced, it's, it drops down even faster. And so it makes sense to work out that body part again mm. three days later instead of seven days later. Yeah. Um, and then again, like I'll, I'll go back to that whole body anabolic signal. When you're training your whole body in one workout, that is a very loud build muscle signal that you're sending your body. When I'm training just my back or just my shoulders, that signal is not quite as loud. Um, and as far as bodybuilders are concerned, look, here's the thing. When you look at bodybuilders and influencers on social media, you are looking at gen people who genetically are gifted. And when I say gifted, it just means that they're 1%. They're, they're, they, they really are 1%. I've met uh, people like this. Uh, very, And I haven't met a lot of them, by the way. Remember, I've worked in fitness for a long time, and I can maybe think of a few people I've ever met in my entire life that I would even put in this category. And these are people who... You know, I look at them, I'm like, man, your pecs look crazy. Like, what do you do for your chest? Like, oh, I do 20 push-ups every other day. You know, like, what? That doesn't make any sense. 20 yeah. push-ups. Like, you know, just incredible, ridiculous genetics. And then on top of it, you throw on anabolic steroids, which keeps the anabolic signal loud longer than for the average person. So you get someone like me, average guy, I go work out my back, body wants to, you know, repair and then build. That signal may last for 24, 48 hours. For this genetic anomaly guy, or on steroids, or on yeah. steroids, that signals loud all the time. Either the steroids are keeping that signal loud because you have this artificial hormonal signal, or your genetics just so happen to put you in favor of constantly building muscle. Well, and to your point of uh, like a louder signal and like the exercises that you know have the most effect, and we talk about squats and bench and like these compound uh, lifting exercises are you know, going to give you the best bang for your buck. Well, when you're doing a split, a lot of times, like it, it starts to degrade after all, you start to use more like isolated, you know, types of machines and things that don't, aren't quite as demanding. And so, uh, be, because, 
because of the fact that, you know, it you're, you're doing all this volume that same day. Yep, and yep. so to be able to spread it out, now I could focus on uh, exercises that actually promote, you know, the most growth. It's also always about, too, learning how to s- scale volume properly. And I think this is overlooked a lot. And I think there's a lot of people that listen to the show that may not know that the way we wrote the programs, we've, we've designed them in an order that you should technically scale up. Unless you're someone who's coming into the show for the first time and you're already super advanced and you already got a, a, a crazy physique and you want to jump into one of the most intense or high volume programs that we have. But for the most people that are listening, the, the ideal progression is you should follow MAPS Anabolic, then go to a performance, then go to aesthetic, and then go to a split, and then the pinnacle would be PED. And what's nice about that, you get you, you get your chance to run a split type of routine, but we build you up over that time. Get the most bang for your buck working out the least, which would be three-day-a-week type of a routine, and then allow yourself to progress all the way up to where you're doing more of a five- to six-day of a split routine, and then the ultimate, which mm-hmm. is a you know two day a workout type of routine, which is PED. Yeah, but even even a full body workout like Maps Aesthetic is is full body based. Maps Aesthetic is high volume and is very appropriate for competitors. I've, I've I get DMs every day from people who use Maps Aesthetic to uh, to get ready for a show, and the way it's broken down is it's three full body workouts, but then in between you can pick other body parts to add even more volume and frequency. Um, so I, I firm look. Here's the deal: if you and you can ask any strength coach, you can ask any trainer who's been training people for years and years and years, people with lots of experience, and they will agree. That you can find articles online where they've actually had discussions like this. It's probably safe to say that eight to nine out of ten people are just going to get better results with a full body type workout. So that that means that one or two out of ten may do better with a split. So the vast majority of you are just going to do better with a full body workout for a lot of the reasons that we talked about. And as far as exercise is concerned, I want to circle back to that because if you're hitting your your legs in one day, you're going to do barbell squats as one of your exercises. If you hit your legs three days during the week and split up the volume, you have an opportunity to, to do the most effective lower body exercise of all time three times. Now you could do it three times and you may not even do the less effective, almost, dare I say, waste of time exercise like a leg extension, which is necessary when you're doing all 20 sets in one workout. So full body workouts, just in our experience with most people, just are superior for most people, um, hands down. And by the way, early day bodybuilders, before steroids, before all this other shit, when they were just working out and observing how the bodies responded, when they were all natural because these just drugs didn't exist, that's how they all worked out. Look at the old routines. All of them did full body workouts. Next question is from Grace Magot. What's the best way to stop or help with a pretty bad binging problem? My relationship with food has been so bad for so long, I just can't seem to figure out how to fix it. Um, awareness is the key. You must bring awareness to the problem. And I don't mean awareness like you're aware that you have this issue because you obviously are. I mean, bring awareness to uh, when it happens. And so there's a few strategies that you can do. These are the strategies that I've, I have found. And by the way, this is not, we're not talking about clinical, uh, like binging, like, uh, like bulimia. That's something that you need to see a professional for. I'm, I, I'm assuming that this person's talking about the typical, like I just, I'll eat a whole bag of chips or right. a bunch of cookies, okay? Uh, the strategies that I have found to be most successful revolve around bringing awareness around uh, the situation when it occurs. So there's a couple things you can do. One, install obstacles between you and the binging uh, and the foods that are trigger foods. And create obstacles in front of yourself. So what's an obstacle? Um, an not, obstacle not in your house. Yeah, an obstacle would be I need to drive to the store to to get these trigger foods. So don't have them in the house. So that's one obstacle. And, and obstacles give you an opportunity to stop and reflect on what's going on. Because here's what's happening when you binge. When you binge, you're in a state of unawareness where you're literally eating and eating and eating. And what you'll find is that your your goal is to get the food in your mouth as fast as possible and eat as fast as possible. It's, 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 all, it's the wanting is actually more powerful than the having because you have it in your mouth, but you want more. And it's all about the wanting. So we have to stop that process. Create those obstacles in between. So one obstacle, don't have these trigger foods around in your house. Here's another obstacle. Stop when you find yourself 
in this state, we're like, oh shit, I want to like go nuts on that bag of chips. Stop yourself. Here's the hard part. Stop yourself. I mean, the reason why it's hard is because what you don't realize is you don't want to, part of you doesn't want to be aware. Part of you wants to continue to find relief uh, in this behavior. So you have to stop, which may make you realize, oh, I'm not feeling good. That's why I'm doing this. But stop, pause, and write down how you feel. And as silly as this sounds, it makes a fucking huge difference. Um, the other thing you could do is you could stop, drink a big glass of water, wait five minutes. So all you're doing is you're just, you're, 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 you're separating you from the action with some obstacles uh, and some time. The second thing is to not judge yourself if this happens and not judge yourself if it doesn't happen. So here's what I mean by that. Let's say you, uh, you, do, the, you do what I say. You install the obstacles. You still binge. You still eat a whole bag of cookies or whatever. After you're done, say to yourself, okay, that happened. Moving on. Because adding a layer of bad feelings around it adding a layer of judgment. Think about it this way. The things that tend to motivate us to binge eating are typically bad feelings. Anxiety, stress, depression, uh, whatever. Just they're typically bad feelings. What you're doing by judging yourself after it's already done, because it's already been, it's already happened. You've already eaten the food. What's happened at, when you judge yourself afterwards is you're creating more bad feelings. Those are the same bad feelings that motivate you to do it again. This is why it becomes a cycle. So if it happens, stop and just say, okay, uh, that happened, moving on. Now, if you don't binge, I also suggest you don't judge it. Don't, don't do this. Like, you, okay, I did the obstacle. I did what Sal said. Wow, I didn't binge. I'm so good. I'm so great. Like, I'm succeeding. Don't do that because that'll set you up for worse judgment the next time you fail. Instead, again, say to yourself, cool, I didn't do that. Moving on. Those things right there can make a tremendous difference in this behavior that, that tends to become a kind of the sy systemic behavior that, that is a very unaware behavior that we tend to have. I think it also helps to, to set a goal for yourself. Um, and I, typically, I like clients to set like a 30-day goal. Uh, this is why I actually like kind of the philosophy behind the uh, Whole30, where for 30 days, uh, you only eat whole foods. And a lot of this this binging comes from these cravings. The same thing if you were a, a big cigarette smoker and you smoked a pack of cigarettes uh, on a regular basis and then all of a sudden decided that you don't want to and then you resist for one day and then you, you those cravings are just killing you. Then you have it and you start puffing away like crazy. I mean, your body is... Uh, Come or has become addicted to a lot of these highly uh, palatable and uh, addictive foods, and so what it's really tough for people they rest they refrain from it for a few days, and then they you know they give in, and then when they give in, they go bananas because of that craving, and then it tastes so amazing when they have it again. So one of the best things that you can do is to resist from it, set a goal for yourself on a certain amount of days. Uh, of none of it in into your diet whatsoever until you work on a better relationship for these types of foods where you can allow it in and out of the diet and not go down the the binging. So I think help and it, it gets easier too. So the the longer you go without these types of foods in your diet, the easier it is for you to resist the binging. If it's something that you resist for three to five days and then you binge, you resist you, you keep falling into that pattern. It's really tough to break that until you set a goal for yourself. It's yeah, it, and become comfortable with your feelings. Um, you know, because we're talking about not just oh, I'm, my diet isn't that good. We're talking about binging, which is the 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 behavior where you eat until you're uncomfortable, you eat until your your stomach hurts, or you eat just a, an amount of food that you would consider um, like not reasonable. Like okay, instead of eating two or three cookies, I ate you know a whole sleeve of cookies, or I ate a whole bag of chips. Like what, what just happened? Like, I feel uncomfortable. I don't feel good. You have to become comfortable with your feelings. Like what is causing you to reach for that temporary relief? Cause that's really what it is while you're eating, while you're binging food creates good feelings. It just does. Obviously that's why we enjoy eating. That's why so many things revolve around food. It feels good. So if you're sad or if you're bored or if you're anxious, all uncomfortable feelings, that distraction of eating and then the feel good of, of that we get from eating those those temporary feel good feelings it distracts us from those negative type feelings 
And so it is a, a temporary solution. Unfortunately, it, it causes more problems, right? Because then you start to feel terrible, your stomach hurts, maybe you're, you're overweight, your health is bad, now you're feeling worse. And this is why you see people go down this spiral. This is why binging uh, in this way kind of resembles addictive, pers- uh, you know, addictive uh, type behaviors where you know, it becomes irrational. Like, why do I keep doing this? You know, and I know people have had those, those, those thoughts to themselves. Like, why do I do this? The last time I did this, my stomach hurt and I didn't feel good. Why did I do it now? This is why it's so important to not judge yourself because mm-hmm. that only creates more negative feelings, which are the drivers behind what you're doing. And the other thing I said, install things that will that are between you and the behavior. And that's journaling. It could be drinking a glass of water. It could be, I have to drive to the store to get this food. And it sounds easy. It sounds easy, but it's not. It's simple, but it's not easy. And the reason why it's not easy is because we don't want to fully become aware of our feelings. That's why we're reaching for that food in the first place. Well, to add to your point on, you know, not beating yourself up, the strategy that I used when I was getting re- when I was preparing myself to get ready to get into like competition prep mode and never in my life before have have I ever done something where I knew that for months and months I would have to be like perfect on my dieting. So that that was completely foreign to me. Even being a trainer and keeping myself in relatively pretty good shape. Uh, to get into competition shape, I knew would require a whole new level of discipline and consistency. And s- what I used to do is I would compete with myself. And I knew what what Sal's talking about. I knew I couldn't, uh, you know, fuck up on the diet one day or overconsume on something and then beat myself over it. I would that would be just a vicious cycle. So I was aware enough and smart enough to know I I didn't need to allow that. So what I would do is I would set a goal of. You know, hey, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be dialed perfect for the next seven days. Seven days of following the plan, being consistent, doing everything you do, and then it, the goal was to make it there. And let's say on day seven, I end up having something, and I I binge, I overeat, I overconsume. Instead of letting that spiral me down and making a big deal about it, it's like no big deal. But now I'm gonna make over at least eight days. I'm going to get, I did seven, seven's the best I've done. I fucked up at day seven. Next time, the next eight days, I'm going to, I cannot do this again for eight days. I'm going to keep building on that. And I just kept, and of course, when I get to day eight, I'm like, oh, I'm good. I can go to nine. I can go to 10. Then I hit maybe day 11 or 12. Oh, a fuck up happened. I didn't, I didn't have a perfect diet. No big deal. That's okay. Next goal is stretch 13 days or 14 days. And I would just keep building on that until it got to a point where, I was starting to string weeks and then months together of this consistency of eating good foods that I know that were benefiting me towards my goal. And then it got easier and easier to be more consistent. And then when you'd have those days every once in a while, it also causes less of a setback. When you string together you know, 30 days of great eating and you have one bad day and then you're right back to eating good again, it ain't, a bit, it ain't that big of a deal. What happens with people that tend to binge like this is to Sal's point again is they beat themselves over it and then they get kind of the fuck it attitude. It's like, oh, I fucked up already on my diet and I way overdid it and I feel terrible tomorrow. And then it allows them to to do that. I mean, we see this in all behaviors, not just food. I mean, that's mm-hmm. how people end up being cheaters too. That's why I say a cheater is always a cheater. You end up cheating in a relationship and you do something like that and you you're like, fuck, I already did it. So you justify it a second time and a third time. The same thing goes with your your dieting and food. You you fuck up like that. You beat yourself up over it. It's like, move on from it. Set a goal to be a better version uh, the next coming to. Yeah, I had a client who years ago wanted to quit uh, smoking cigarettes. And I, some of the strategies that, that he used, I think, uh, are similar to the strategies that we're talking about now. One thing that he did was, at one point, he said, if I want a cigarette, then I have to drive to the store to buy them, and then I'll smoke whatever I want. Whatever's left over, I throw away. So each time I want a cigarette, I have to get in the car and drive to the store. And so he did this for a little while and actually reduced his, his cigarette consumption because, well, he has to stop. He has to, on the drive there, he has to think about the fact that he wants a cigarette and it kind of mm-hmm. interrupted, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, interrupted that behavior. The other thing that he did is he created a mantra, and this was personal to him, and I don't know what it was, but he had a mantra and he said every time he wanted a cigarette, he would say this mantra to himself. And it was just enough time for him to stop and interrupt the that behavior, but also remind himself of why he doesn't want to, you know, smoke cigarettes anymore. So that's another I've used that strategy with a couple clients where they create a mantra and it could be anything like, I really care about myself. I love myself. I want to take care of myself. Whatever it is, read this mantra to yourself. Just interrupt that cycle. But if you can interrupt that cycle enough times, it stops becoming 
a natural go-to behavior every time you you have whatever feeling it was that was motivating you to do that in the first place. Next question is from Richie Laugh 13. How does alcohol affect your gym routine? Makes it way funner. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys ever work out? Sweat a lot more. Have you guys ever worked out buzzed or drunk? Have you ever done that before? I have. You have? Yeah. I, I remember I had an early morning workout and the night before, like I was still drunk, you know, because I just <laughs> drank too much. And so I started like working out and oh man, it was it was a struggle. It was it was a big struggle. The, just the fatigue getting through the the reps and the sets was substantial like i just didn't have the kind of stamina like yeah. i normally do yeah i did it once uh, i i used to run this gym and there was a sports bar in there so there was like wine and beer or whatever yeah and we would close at 10 o'clock at night on fridays and me and the staff got started drinking and we got drunk and then i decided to do a workout and i pulled my lat muscle. You know how hard it is to pull a lat muscle? <laughs> yeah, you go yeah. in tight already, too. Yeah, stupid. It's like the uh, hydrated. Yeah, but I mean, you know, here's the deal. Alcohol, and I'm not just talking about being drunk and working out. Obviously, this person's <laughs> asking, like, drinking and then working yeah, out How sober, do you balance but, it both? Right. Alcohol is a 100% negative effect on, on fitness. Yeah. There's no yeah. positive uh, whatsoever. It's uh, You kind of have to just recognize that right mm -hmm. away. It's yeah. a, well, not, nothing, nothing spikes blood sugar harder than than alcohol right it's the it's the top of the the list as far as like things that spike blood sugar and prime your body to be ready to store fat mm. so when you're talking about working out and trying to get in shape because typically most people are working out to lose body fat build muscle and when you add something into your diet like alcohol and, and very few people like we're not talking about one drink either like Somebody having a glass of wine once a week or a beer once a week is is very little as far as the, the the detriments to that. But it's the three, four, five beers, and then it's also what you tend to do after that that is really detrimental. That's to a your good point because alcohol is a very very strong uh, uninhibitor. It, it, it makes you feel less inhibited for everything. So. You if you it, it, people listening right now know exactly what I'm talking about. Like you go out with your friends, you drink. It's the end of the night, one o'clock in the morning. Nine out of ten times, what do you do? You go get some shitty ass food, right? right? Mm -hmm. Fast food or whatever. Now, is it because alcohol makes you hungrier? Not necessarily. It's because it lowers your inhibitions. It's the reason why you're more likely to have sex with a random person on alcohol, or you're more likely to punch someone in the face on alcohol. You're just less inhibited. The part of your brain that says, you probably shouldn't do that. You're not going to feel good or whatever. Yeah. That part gets turned off, and so then you're like, hey, I got a good idea. Let's, let's do it. Let's go eat some jack-in-the-box tacos, you know, or yeah. whatever. It also it also plays a little mind fuck too, to Justin's point, because it does do this. It dehydrates you, which kind of like pulls out some of the water, and you fills up all of your glycogen, so your muscle bellies get filled out. So a lot of times, and anyone listening who's, who's drank heavy the night before and then woke up in the morning, how many times have you woke up from a hard night of drinking and actually looked better? Mm. And so that the psychological- I always look like shit. So- <laughs> <laughs> the psychological part, and I'm, I mean physically, not your face and your terrible sleep and stuff like that, but your body, your stomach, mm -hmm. your gut. A lot of times you'll wake up after Can't a night of drinking and you think, oh, wow, I thought I did all this damage last night, but I don't look so bad. And that ends up causing you to make more bad choices uh, leading from mm -hmm. that. And then it, it it's also uh, how it affects sleep, right? So your your alcohol also, uh, you know, is- uh, Makes sleep terrible. Makes sleep really bad. Uh, that then affects your workout the next day. Uh, to me, it's one of the things, it's one of the most crippling things that you can do while you are while you have serious fitness school. But it's, it's fun. Right? It's a, yeah. Yeah. And, and no, that's a good point, Justin, because at the end of the day, though, when you're looking at your health, it's a, it's a sphere that contains everything. So there is the physiological aspect of health, your body, your liver, your muscles, like all the things that can be affected by alcohol negatively. But then there's also the emotional side of things uh, and emotional health. And if you're out with your family or your friends and you haven't seen them in a while or whatever, and you're having some wine or some beer or some drinks and you're just connecting and you're genuinely having a really good time with these people – that's memorable, that you're connecting with these people, can that positively impact your health? Absolutely. Look, if you took someone, you put them in isolation, and you fed them perfectly and had them exercise per perfectly, their health will be terrible because they're isolated from other people and from those connections. And alcohol 
sometimes is part of that, you know, that, that, that whole culture around, you know, connecting with people. Now, can it be used negatively in that way also? Can alcohol negatively affect your emotional health? You better fucking believe it. Like, you could go out with your friends, drink a bunch, and then have a terrible argument mm-hmm. and act like an asshole or whatever. So I think there's a smart way to do it. So it's not as simple as, like, don't drink, you know, because it's bad for your, your fitness and health. Yeah. Ah, you got you to gotta be smart enough to kind of weigh it out because I do think, look, there's times when, yeah. when we, you know, we drank. We went to Manhattan Beach for that live event. We all enjoyed some alcohol. And, yes, my physical performance, when I went to the gym the next day, I wasn't as strong. I didn't feel as fit the calories from the alcohol, my gut was off or whatever. But was it worth the trade of hanging out with you guys and our families and connecting and laughing and, and laughing and all? Definitely. Definitely yeah. worth that, you know, the, the, the few days of shitty workouts, I, in my opinion. But I, if I do it all the time, it might yeah, not be worth it. Yeah, see, I 100% well. agree, but I also am very careful on how I talk about this because I know that People just want an excuse. Yeah, we're yeah. not giving them a pass. Well, how many times have you guys had yeah. a client before who will tell you this, like, uh, you know, I want to get in shape. I want to lose all this weight, whatever. Um, but I am not giving up Sunday fun day with the girls and I'm not, you know, Can I, I skip a meal instead. Right. And so they're, they, <sighs> they, they feel that they need this, this day of drinking or this weekend sometimes of, yeah. of being able to drink and can I still get really fit? And they, everybody has a friend who's the exception to the rule who looks amazing. She's got a great body or he's got a great body and you always see him getting fucked up at the club all the time. And so you, you too want to know how can you figure this out and for the for the majority of people if you have real serious fitness goals you're trying to make physical change and that's a major priority for you alcohol is a terrible thing yeah. to have it's in gonna there. get in your way yeah yes. especially if you have a serious goal so just keep that in mind so it's it is great you know for hanging out and for making you know fun times with your friends and all that kind of stuff but like at the end of the day if you're really trying to like make a body change and, and a health change it's, it's going to get in your way well here's the other thing too back to your point adam when they said i need to have my my sunday fun day or i need to have my once a week with my buddies where we get where we drink or whatever to those people because i've had those clients too that's that's quite common to those people, I would say this, uh, rather than looking to that one day as that one day where you enjoy yourself and connect, r- look at all the other days and try to understand and realize why it's so important that you have this one day of reprieve. Like if, if, that's how you're, if that's how you balance your life out, that you have one day where you go off and drink because the rest of your life is so hard and stressful and terrible, right. rather than maintaining that one day of, of, of doing that with alcohol, look at the rest of the days. And think to yourself, like, why is it that I look so forward to this one day a week where I can drink? Is it do I hate the rest of my life so much? And if I do, what can I change about it to make my life more balanced and more healthy? Not to mention to that point also, and I think this was the last Instagram Friday fitness tip that uh, Rachel posted up uh, that I talked about, which was one of the biggest game changers for me was uh, starting to make the best health choices or the best food choices and activity choices on Saturday and Sunday. And if I really wanted alcohol or I really wanted pizza or I really wanted a burger, then I would just discipline myself to have it somewhere on Monday through Friday because I was the most active and the most consistent with my diet during Monday through Friday. If I were to sleep in, sit on my ass and go out to eat and do all these other things that weren't most ideal for my body or creating movement, that's also the worst time that you could you sit down Sunday fun day, you go shopping with the girls and you sit at some restaurant for three hours and you drink five margaritas. That's probably the worst thing. Now, if you have a job where you're out and you're moving and you're taking 15,000 steps throughout the day, you ate perfect all day long, you got your gym routine in in the morning, and then you decide you want to go have a couple of drinks later on at dinner, probably not as de- as detrimental as the Sunday fun day where you didn't do anything really physical other than going shopping. You sat on your ass for three or four hours and you drank five margaritas. That's going to set you back further. And when you when you start to make habits like that, where you say, okay, I'm not going to say I can't have alcohol, but I'm going to start to make, I'm going to plan it in better parts or better times in my week. And then what ends up happening is that Tuesday happens. You were great. You were consistent. You ate well. And you're like, ah, do I really want that margarita tonight? It's not that big of a deal. I'll save it for another event. Next question is from the Maple Leaf Man. Would you guys ever do a powerlifting competition? Why or why not? I love powerlifting. I love strength competitions, uh, just all of them, mainly because they're so objective. I love them for the right. same reasons why I dislike, uh, although I still respect, but the reason why I dislike physique and bodybuilding is that they're so subjective that there's a judge 
judging you and telling you who's better and who's not better. Yeah, you have real metrics with powerlifting. Powerlifting, it's like you lift the weight or you don't, you're stronger or you're not. Um, I also like that there's an unhealthy, there can be an unhealthy component with any type of competition, but powerlifting, I've pushed certain clients into powerlifting over bodybuilding and physique and bikini because powerlifting takes the emphasis off of body image a little bit more than those competitions do. Oh, so, a lot more. So if I had like a female you know, client who's like, I just want to do a competition and I'm thinking about bikini and I would try to convince her to do powerlifting because then she's more focused on just getting stronger, mm-hmm. being able to move better type of stuff, which tends to be healthier. Not saying you can get unhealthy because you totally can with all those competitions, but as far as, as, as whether I've ever considered one, I did. Uh, at one point, I thought uh, very strongly about doing a powerlifting competition. What prevented me from doing one was just the organization of finding one uh, and scheduling it and doing it. Um, but I would love to do it. I, I really, as far as my own competitive lifts and stuff, I'm pretty sure I would have done okay with my deadlift. I'm pretty sure I would have gotten buried with my bench press and I, I would have been okay uh, with my squat. But the deadlift would have been where I thought I would have done best. But I really love them. I love watching them. I love, I, at one point I followed powerlifting. I used to subscribe to a, a powerlifting magazine. This was back in the late nineties and two thousands. Um, when, you know, you had like guys like Ed Cohn, you know, lifting or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, what do they call him? Kirk Kowalski. I think it was, I don't remember what his last name was Captain Kirk. They called him just monsters, you know, and you meet power lifters and they're just the, the, the their presence was just so cool. I, c- I could have easily, I think fell into this. Um, had I not done the bodybuilding direction, because I also don't think I really belong in bodybuilding. I don't think I really belong in powerlifting. And what I mean by I don't belong, I don't think that, um, I don't think I'm very strong. Uh, I don't think I have the best genetics or I'm very symmetrical. So I don't think I really, it, that's not my sport or it's not what I do well. And, you know, basketball, swimming, these are things that uh, I, I would, would I'd rather be competitive in those things. I like to be it's competitive in things that I'm probably already a little natural good at, and then I could build upon that and be really good at it. Mm. Uh, but I, I did find, uh, I, I enjoyed knowing that I, I probably didn't have a great physique for uh, bodybuilding and working towards building one that I could compete at the highest level. So I did get a kick out of that, and I could have easily fell into powerlifting. Said what drove me to bodybuilding was the the business side of it. I saw that that was who was on covers of magazines, uh, and and unfortunately, even though powerlifters probably ha- are well more versed in programming and probably presenting better information as far as lifting than bodybuilders are, uh, I, but that's what I saw. I saw the opportunity. I saw. Oh wow! Look at all these people that have amazing physiques. They're on covers of magazines, and they're giving shit information. Uh, so I thought, okay, I could come in there, even though I may not have the greatest of physiques. I can work my way up this, get a name for myself, and then present better information. And then I can find a place for myself to fit. Powerlifting, uh, I'd probably get my ass kicked. Um, I have a, a, a okay deadlift. I have an okay squat. I have an okay bench, and so. I probably wouldn't have made a name for myself. There's really good program. There's a lot of really good coaches, I think, in that space in comparison. I think the the bodybuilding space, uh, and this is an overgeneralization, but for the most part, most of them are idiots. Uh, most of the information that's being provided, I think, is, is terrible, and so I saw opportunity there. I didn't see a lot of opportunity in powerlifting. I knew that I probably wouldn't have been that great at it, too, so I, I don't think I would ever get into it like that. I also... Um, you know everything has a has a risk and uh, risk high risk high reward type of deal with powerlifting. Uh, w- when I was chasing Sal and his deadlift numbers, uh, I definitely had some of the most uh, joint pain and and issues that I've ever had in my life. So oh for, yeah, it's high. It's powerlifting yeah. is a high risk, very demanding. Yeah, yeah it's high joints. risk on your joints. Yeah, so that part of it, I'm I'm not a fan. Like that was also something that I instill today when when talking about. Uh, you know, powerlifting versus bodybuilding. You know, the thing about bodybuilding is that bodybuilding is something that you could probably do all the way till you're 80 years old. You know, mm-hmm. you can continue to do that. It's there's a lot of uh, things that you can do that are not as taxing as as powerlifting. Powerlifting can be very taxing. Yeah, you're constantly pushing your your limits in terms of your strength. Yeah, of and, course. And I don't think I have the most advantageous levers. For yeah, you that. have long arms and long legs. Yeah. Which, and the, the, some of the things that make a, somebody good at bodybuilding are things that would make you not so good yeah. typically at powerlifting. Like a small waist 
looks really good on stage. A yeah. small waist doesn't help yeah. you squat more. Uh, yeah, yeah it's squat break you in half. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, and then that's the thing. Like, I would much rather, if I was to have to do one or the other, like a bodybuilding or powerlifting, I would definitely have leaned a lot more into the powerlifting side just because, uh, for me, I've always revered strength and I've revered people who, uh, you know, can perform these strength feats and, like, lots of weight. And, you know, there's a definite appeal to that, but... I didn't find myself as being genetically super gifted in that direction either. Like I, I might've been more inclined to do it when I was younger, while I was going through sports and football and like the training process of it. I've always found that I loved the training side of it even more than actually the game. But, um, in terms of like the actual lifts that they accomplished, I was terrible deadlifting. So that would have been one that had been tough for me, uh, in terms of a learning curve where I'd have to really spend like, I feel like years, like really trying to figure that out and like get better, uh, with my approach, my, uh, you know, my technique with that. Um, but in terms of like the squat, I've been okay. You know, I've been all right with the bench. Like I got pretty far with the bench. It was a focus of mine when I was lifting real heavy. And, and that was something that did increase. And I, I did see promise in that. But um, in terms of right now, like, I mean, somebody would have to challenge me to do it. You know, that would probably be the only way you'd get me to do it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, like I'm going to look for something maybe a little more, I don't know, functional, like something uh, still a challenge, but maybe a little less demanding on on my joints. I'm trying to like, you know, survive going forward. Yeah. You know, uh, with powerlifting, um, the, the, if you here's the thing, too, if you look at like Instagram and you look at how much people are lifting in power lifting competitions that can be very discouraging because you could see a guy like you know like I, I would compete in under 190 pounds if I were powerlifting around 190 pounds and if I go on Instagram I'm like oh my god this dude's 190 and he's deadlifting 750 pounds or 800 pounds why the fuck would I ever compete? I know it's like but I did my research and if you do your research and you look at local events and you look at like raw drug tested or whatever mm -hmm. at one point I had my deadlift at 600 pounds I probably would have done pretty damn good in local events. So if, if, don't let that be something that 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 discourages you. Um, the cool thing about powerlifting is you go, you compete, you compete with yourself, mm -hmm. you do better for yourself, and you compete in these local competitions. They have drug tested ones. They have raw, which means you're not allowed you're not allowed to use some of the gear like squat suits and stuff like that, which is now becoming much more popular. Um, the thing about powerlifting, like Adam touched on, uh, they understand exercise programming. Bodybuilders are terrible. At exercise programming. Now, where powerlifters suck is diet. Uh, they don't understand diet very well in comparison mm -hmm. to bodybuilders. So a lot of powerlifters, just for the sake of lifting an extra five pounds on the bar, will eat a shitty diet and gain you know, way too much uh, body fat. Um, and when it comes to cutting weight to make their weight, many powerlifters aren't really sure uh, of how to do it the right way. So I could see a lot of crossover and things that they can learn. But I respect and value strength athletes uh, tremendously more than any other type of athlete, uh, that, that utilizes weights. Like I love, if I meet someone and they lift something heavy and that's what they compete in, it just, it just gives, it's just a whole new level of respect for me. At least it's just something that I've always, you know, valued totally. and revered, you know? Um, and with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin on at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at MindPumpMedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.